Here we go. Uh, I'm Wes. Um, I work at Chartbeat. Uh, and this talk is going to be about sharding, um, which uh, hopefully all of you have uh, some, some notion of what sharding is. Um, along with sharding, uh, what, you know, uh, going, hand, uh, going hand in hand with sharding is, is, um, uh, is, uh, is hashing. So I'll also be talking about um, uh, some different hashing techniques that, um, you know, that are very useful for sharding. So um, my approach here is going to be a little bit unusual. Uh, I have some... I have some demos that I wrote up um, that we'll, we'll be looking at, so it'll be part empirical. Um, I'm also going to be trying to reason from sort of first principles, you know, to go through some of these algorithms. So if you look these things up on the web, the approaches that you'll find on the web are, are a bit different than this. Um, I'm hoping that means that this will be... Uh, um, so, uh, yeah, avoiding work. Um, I really like to avoid work. So this is my favorite thing. Um, one one way for us to improve the performance of, of our sites is basically just not you know not do work that we we don't have to do, and you know especially uh, don't do work that you've already done before. So um, before you just right you just cache as many things as you can, um, and you want to cache the heavy things. So. Um, so for instance, uh, in a typical website, um, a common thing to cache would be a query to, uh, to your database. For instance, then you're looking at query times that would be at best um, maybe three or four milliseconds. Uh, typical query times probably more like 100 milliseconds if you're lucky. Um, whereas uh, if, you, um, if, you, uh, if you are able to save the result right, and store it somewhere else and you make a query to that, uh, typical round trip times on a network uh, are measured in fractions of a millisecond. So this this could be a, 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 a could be a huge win. So there's this program called Memcache, which we've we've probably all heard of before. Um, Memcache is a key value store, uh, and the keys and values are opaque, meaning that Memcache itself doesn't really care what the keys and the values are. Uh, each key value pair, so these 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 objects have uh, TTLs attached to them. For the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to ignore the TTLs. Um, Memcache is pretty mature, and so there's, there have been a lot of uh, performance uh, tunings and improvements that have gone into it, so it's very, very high performance. Um, but it only runs on one server. So we'll, uh, we'll see how, how that's an issue um, in a few minutes. Uh, so the typical memcache pattern is this. Um, you, uh, you've got uh, some sort of computation or something, or you know, like a, a query to your database that's associated with a key. So you know, an example might be if you're looking at the uh, profile page for some for some user on Twitter, um, there might be a lookup that gets uh, their followers, but you don't, you don't want to be looking up their followers every single time, so you throw that into memcache. So the pattern usually looks like this. So you attempt to get the value from memcache, that's the mc.get line. Um, then if, uh, if the value is not there, then you actually go and compute it. Uh, and then you place it into memcache and you return it. So the second time that you run through this loop, the value will already have, uh, have been computed and exists in memcache you'll skip this compute value line um, and you'll, oh, you'll just return your, uh, your save value. All right, so we're done. Um, talk's over. Uh, we're hiring, of course. If you guys have any questions, then I can take them now. Um, yeah, no, if, if only it were this easy. So um, uh, one issue with, uh, with memcache is that uh, it tries to keep all the key value pairs in memory. So if you run out of memory, um, well, that's a problem. Uh, also, the, uh, while it's very high performance, the server can only respond to some number of requests per second. So if you exceed that, that's a problem as well. So one way you solve this is you just run several memcache servers. Um, but then you've got this problem of, OK, well, I've got some key, and I want to put it on one of these servers. Which server should I put it on? So this is, uh, so, so this is the, uh, the, the, the sharding problem. Um, uh, so the, uh, the two takes on it um, uh, you know, that we'll consider are load balancing and uh, uh, data replication. So load balancing is, you know, I've got some piece of work. I want to do work on one of these shards. Um, where should we do the work? Um, and replication is, I've got some piece of data, and I want to put this on some shard. Um, where should it go? Okay. So um, so we've got some key that's associated with some computation, right? So we like to place it on some shard. Uh, what are some of the goals for this key, right? Okay. So the thing the uh, the, uh, the, the calculation of which shard the key goes to must be faster than the thing that we're trying to compute first off, right? Okay. Um, it, uh, it can't fail more often than the shards. 
Um, you would like for the key to be spread across all the shards uh, in an equal way. Um, and uh, this, this fourth property kind of falls out from the, from the first three is that the, um, the clients that are using um, this, uh, this, this mapping need to be mostly stateless. Um, if, you, uh, if you have them share state, then you have a coordination problem, and that's hard. Um, so this implies there's a small amount of state that we'll share, um, and we want the function to be uh, pretty, pretty balanced. So the standard way of going about this is just to take the key, um, and you hash it, and then you map that to one of your, of, of, of your shards. So you know, let's say that we've got three memcaf servers here, right? Um, so the, uh, this, uh, this, this first line says, OK, we'll, 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 convert, we'll convert the key into a number, uh, and the hashing function should produce a fairly random looking number, um, mod that by three, um, which will give us a value of zero, one, or two, and zero, one, and two will map to, uh, to which, which shards we're going to. So uh, the pattern changes very slightly, right? We look up a different uh, shard to go to, but the last one, two, three, four, five, six lines of code are all the same. Um, are, are there any questions about this? No, okay. All right, simulated reality. Live demo time. See if this actually works. Okay, so um, so here I, I, have a, uh, I have a small program that um, it's it's a very uh, uh, dumb version of memcache, and I'm just gonna hammer this thing with requests. Um, I, have, I have a handy little config file there, and let's see. Um, uh, so so apologies. So I I pulled this together um, fairly quickly, and I'm using this this uh, this graphing framework called Rickshaw, and I cannot figure out how to get. Uh, labels to work on it. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, so so the uh, this this uh, this blue graph is uh, his, is is hits per second. Uh, the y-axis is um, the max of the y is 100. So we're looking at around uh, around 70 hits per second. Uh, the red graph is misses, right? So you can see at the very start of the program there were a bunch of misses, and then the cache got warmed up, and now now we just have have a, you know have essentially all hits. Okay. So let's say that uh, our shards have gotten overwhelmed. So we have three shards right now, and uh, let's add a fourth shard in. Okay, so I'm gonna do this, and then let's see what happens. Oh, that hurt, right? So the idea with putting the fourth shard in, right, is because we're hitting some, some constraints, um, we need more capacity, and yet when I, when I put that server in, um, I, I, I have this huge spike in errors. Okay, so that's a problem. So uh, yeah. So what is uh, stop this? Okay. What is going on here? Um, okay. So right. So let's think about the three node case, right? So um, okay. Uh, the output of hash of key is some number, right? So let's say that we've got some key that hashes to the value of zero. Um, then uh, zero mod three uh, is zero. So we're saying that the keys that hash to zero will map to server zero. That's that's this first line right here. Uh, the keys that hash to one will, will map to server one. Keys that hash to two will map to server two. Now the keys that hash to three will map to server zero. And it just repeats like this, right? This is mod. Great. Um, so what happens if we take the same hash function and now instead of modding by three, we mod by four? Okay, so the left column here is what we just had and the right column is, is, is this mod by four. So, so you can see the first three entries are the same. Um, and then the fourth entry, so in the three node case, when the hash of, of the key uh, came up with three and you modded by three, you got zero. Um, in the second case, in the four node case, if we hash the key and we get three and we mod by four, we get three. So this is actually a cache miss, right? The data that used to be on node zero is now on three, right? Same thing with four, same thing with five, same thing with six. So it's ladies out, so, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just taking the, uh, uh, these, uh, these mapping values right here and putting them out horizontally. Um, so the top row here is, 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 uh, is mod three, and the, and the bottom row is mod four. So you can see we get three hits and then nine misses. And then the whole sequence repeats. We get three hits and nine misses. So what happens is when you go from three to four, your cache hit rate drops down to 25% immediately. So three out of every 12 uh, tries are, um, you know, are, are bad. All right, so how can we fix this? Okay, so. Um, right, so hash mod only looks at the number of nodes. But you would think that, okay, so our, our, our goal here is that when we add a new server, we keep the number of, of, uh, of keys that have to move um, you know, as small as possible, right? So, so to keep that churn down, you would think that we'd have to use information about the nodes in some way, right? But this hash mod technique doesn't use node information at all. It just uses the number of nodes. Um, so 
what can we do? Okay, let's just try something random. Let's throw these nodes on a line. Okay, so I've got this, uh, uh, this line here, so you can see nodes 0, 1, and 2. Um, I've placed these in such a way that these segments are, are the same size, right? So if I didn't know anything about math, I'd say, oh, you know, an obvious way to, uh, to come up with the mapping then is say, uh, I'll take some key, I'll convert it to a number, place it on this line, and whichever node sits to the right of that key, that's the node that the key should be on. Right, does this make sense? Yeah? Okay. Um, unfortunately, I do know a little bit about math, just enough uh, to think I'm right, but oftentimes be wrong. Um, so what happens is when you convert these, uh, these, these nodes to hash values, um, uh, it's totally possible for them to fit on this line in, in a, uh, a non-even way. Right? So, so this is bad. Right? Um, if we use the same algorithm where we also hash, hash k and then we see where it maps on the line, you can see node 1 will get a ton of keys because, because that, you know, that uh, you know, that spacing between 0 and 1 is so big. Okay, so this is an issue. So how do we fix this? Um, so this is where the law of large numbers comes into play. Um, so the law, the law of large numbers says this. If you, if you take a very large number of people and you throw them into an uncomfortable pile like that, um, the more and more uncomfortable this pile gets, uh, the more the average height of the people in the pile will start to, uh, to approach the true average height of all people. Right. This makes this should make intuitive sense, right? Just the more samples that you pull out, then the closer to um, some sort of a pure ideal, you know, those uh, you know those uh, other samples will get. So we like to apply this to the memcache problem. One way to do it is, um, okay, well, you know, we have this problem where where with just three nodes, like there could be this huge spacing. Well, let's just put in a ton of nodes, right? Um, in practice, that's a problem. You can't you can't ask EC2 for for one gazillion nodes, right? Um, I don't know, maybe you can, but um, so uh, so here's what we'll do instead. Okay, so we'll we'll take each node and we'll convert it into some number of v nodes. So so m v nodes, um, and then we'll we'll go and hash these v nodes and we'll throw them onto the line. Uh, now when we look up a key, we do the exact same thing. We hash the key and then we search this line. Okay, so here's an example. So this is n is is three, m is three. So there are nine v nodes. So the, uh, the real nodes are 0, 1, and 2, and then the V nodes are in tiny little numbers. I don't know if you can actually see it, but in small numbers, 0, 0 saying um, uh, this is a real node 0 and, and its virtual version 0. Um, over here we have this 1, 0, so that's real node 0 and its virtual version 0. Over here we have 0, 1, so that's real node 0 and its virtual version 1, for instance, right? So the more and more of these V nodes you get, then the closer these spacings are to the same value, right? To the, to the average. Um, so if we add uh, a fourth node, uh, you know, we're all engineers, right? We can, we can see node three is actually the fourth node. Um, so if, if, if we add this fourth node, um, uh, we split that into three V nodes and we just kind of plop them down. Um, with, with a large enough M, you can see that a, uh, a small amount of data will have to get, uh, get, uh, get moved around. Uh, and uh, as, you, uh, as you increase M, then that amount gets to, uh, to 1 over n, where n is the number of nodes that you've got. All right. So let's see. Um, let's run this thing. Uh, so we will switch to the consistent hashing strategy. So let's start with three nodes. All right. Hello, Keanu. Uh, all right. OK. So this looks a lot like the graph that we saw before. There's, you know, at, at the very start, there's a spike of errors. That's fine. The cache gets warmed up, right? And the cache is nice and warm. So we are going to switch to four nodes now. So there is some, some shuffling, but it's not nearly as bad. Um, in the previous graph, the, the size of this peak was closer to the size of, of, of this peak, right? So, we've, uh, right? so we've drastically eliminated that. So that's cool. That's nice. Um, all right. Um, is there another technique? Okay. So these are the two observations I made before, um, right? To keep the shuffling, uh, you know, as small as possible, we like to take the nodes themselves into account, right? Um, now the key thing to note here is that that the the failure of hash mod is assignment of keys. If we can somehow reduce the reassignment of keys, and you know, maybe we have another technique, right? So, so let's say. Um, uh, with 
with HashMod, um, uh, you basically randomly assign uh, some key to some node um, A, B, or C. Um, what we'd like to do is try to keep those from reshuffling. Um, so instead of just assigning it to A, B, and C, let's assign it to uh, some, uh, some ordering of all of the nodes. Right? So in this case, um, uh, the, uh, the keys that uh, with HashMod are assigned to A will split those um, between uh, the ordering A, B, C and the ordering A, C, B. So half, half the keys go to this ordering and half the keys go to this ordering here. Right? And what we say is that the, the node that the key actually is on is the first, uh, is the first node in that list. Okay, is that confusing at all? I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. So there are six possible combinations of these things, right? So what happens if, uh, if node A goes down, right? Um, so, 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 we, so we pull node A out, right? Uh, the, uh, uh, the keys that were assigned to, to this grouping right, right here, right, they're no longer going to A. Now they're going to the next server in their list, so B or C. So the, the key thing to note here is, is that um, uh, when we remove no, node A, right, one-third of the keys got shuffled. Um, and of those one-third uh, that got, got, uh, got, got shuffled, uh, half of them got assigned to B, and the other half got assigned to C. So that's, that's a nice property, right? So how do we actually do this? Oh, sorry. Okay, so, so when we add some node in, right, um, what happens then? Uh, so so uh, there are um, uh, uh, four possible places where this new node D can go in uh, to the set that was ACB, right? So um, D could go, uh, go at the very start. It could go in spot two, spot three, or spot four. So uh, when we add D in, um, we would expect one-fourth of them would get reassigned to D, and then three-fourths of them would not be reassigned to D. Okay, so how do we actually uh, do this? So this is called rendezvous hashing. Um, so whenever you look up a key, um, what you do is you compute n hash functions, like one for each node, um, and the hash functions are uh, take as input the key and the node. So a very simple way of doing this is you could just concatenate the strings or something, right? Um, then you sort the hashes and you say, okay, the node um, that the key belongs on is the one that has the smallest hash value. How does this work? All right. Let's, uh, whoops. Uh, man, live coding, um, this isn't even live coding. This is live config editing, and I'm screwing it up. Okay, all right. Um, are we, uh, no, no, we want rendezvous. All right, cool. Okay. So um, same graph as before. At the very start, uh, there, there are a bunch of misses. Um, OK, so now the cache is, is warm. Right? Uh, and then we are going to add in the, we are going to add in the fourth node. And what happens? It looks approximately the same as consistent hashing. So that's nice, right? Oops. Uh, all right. What's next? Oh, OK. So, right, so a quick, uh, just, you know, just a couple of the finer points of consistent hashing. And, um, so uh, the way that this works is that you, don't, you do a ton of work at the very start. You, you have to create these, uh, these V nodes, and you run some hash function on them. Um, typically, uh, your M is very big. It's, uh, it's 160. Um, yeah, the reason why it's 160, I can, I can answer that in a question if someone actually cares. Um, when you do a lookup, uh, you do one hash calculation um, that's on the key itself, and then you do a search on uh, on you know, on on the V node hashes. Um, so generally, this requires this this, uh, this requires about seven fixed comparisons, and then uh, and then and then log base two event. Um, rendezvous, uh, you do no work at the very start, but every single lookup requires n plus one hash calculations. That's uh, that's one calculation per node plus a calculation for the key. Um, and then, uh, and then you're looking up is just finding the smallest of of that set. Um, we can improve on this actually. Uh, you can create a a large fixed set of partitions. Say, you know, say we say there are a thousand partitions, and then we'll map the keys into partitions. Then, then what you could do is calculate uh, the n plus one hashes for each partition up front, right at the very start. Then you don't have to do it on every lookup. So, you know, so there there are other ways of improving on this. Um, Okay, shuffle sharding. Um, so the, I, 
I don't know if you can tell, this is supposed to be Professor X and Gambit. Um, Gambit is actually my favorite character in the X-Men. This is a, a, a Pete Holmes skit where he goes and fires every single X-Men. And I think that's the guy from Silicon Valley, but I'm not totally sure, right? Okay. Um, shuffle sharding. Uh, all right. Um, oh, uh, right, I should. Right. Okay, there we go. So I should show you this little web service that I made. Um, okay, so so this is uh, it. Just um, pulls a, it's a profile page ish. <laughs> uh, there's a photo of me um, and some random text there drawn from uh, Lorem, Lorem Ipsum. Uh, I, I have a bunch of people in here. Uh, these are my coworkers, who are probably mortified right now. <laughs> um, so. Uh, so I'm going to just go, go and hammer uh, that thing with requests, and we will look at, um, at, the, at the dashboard for this. All right. So again, uh, blue, those are good requests. Uh, red, these are timeouts, actually, in this case. Um, so what I've actually done is, is, uh, is put a failure case in this service. right? So you can see um, a lot of requests are working, but there are also a lot of errors as well. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, so let me show you what the uh, what the what the actual error there is for one particular user, Riker. The request actually takes five seconds, but it produces a quote by Commander Riker. So that's worth the wait, right? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so um, yeah, so right, so this is the problem. Why don't we try to solve this problem with? Um, the handiest technique in the book. Uh, let's just do a retry. Right now, we're just trying uh, trying the service once. So now I'm going to randomly sample from uh, from these five five servers that I have. Um, I'll pick three of them and I'll retry. All right. Now let's see what happens. Looking good. Uh oh. All right. So notice there there there's actually a gap in which the service is entirely down. Right. So you'll get these these you know these kinds of spikes right where the service is doing really well because the retries are working but then there are gaps where like it's just not working at all. This is probably worse than the first situation. Um, just out of curiosity, like has has anyone seen this in their systems before? Like this sort of massive flapping of like I see it all the time. It's very <laughs> embarrassing. Um, all right. Uh, so yeah. So what what is what is going on here? Um, okay. So the request that I introduced is called a poison pill. Right, so this is this is some request that takes a very long time for whatever reason. Right, um, it could be uh, the query is enormous. Um, maybe it calls a huge number of external queries or something. Uh, maybe maybe the the, uh, the the handler itself has some kind of a bug. Um, maybe somebody is sending in bad input. Right, they're purposely crashing your thing. Maybe it's good input that you just don't handle well, like foreign languages. Nah. All right. Um, so right, so that's a problem. Okay, the, um, uh, so the issue here is this retry behavior, right? So let's say that 10% of the requests are poisonous, right? Um, and, each, and, and each poison um, uh, results in five seconds of wait time, right? If you're doing 500 requests per second, um, there are, uh, 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 there are 50 requests in flight uh, at any point in time. And then if this thing is behind a load balancer, maybe you're doing round robining, right? So your load balancer might actually uh, lay this poison across every single one of your nodes, right? So this, this, this is bad news. This basically equals death. Um, <laughs> so I showed this slide after, uh, we have a keg at work. Um, so I had a couple of beers and I wrote this and I meant to go and change it. Um, uh, it was probably 11. Yeah, you know, like in the morning on a Thursday or something. Um, okay, so so uh, so the magnitude of fuckery, right? Um, so this is proportional to the the uh, right. So uh, the chance of fuckery, right? So PF, right, times the magnitude of a fucked request, right, times the request rate divided by the number of workers that you've got, your concurrency level. Um, so the 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 thing to note here is that R is kind of uh, the value that's going to mean the most. Like it will vary the most. It might spike, right? You know, maybe your um, your Twitter and something bizarre has happened in the world, and lots of people are tweeting it. Or Pi Gotham is happening, and lots of people are tweeting about it, right? Um, uh, that's kind of not you know not something that you can control, right? If that thing increases uh, your errors, then you're in trouble. Um, 
So, uh, so yeah, right. So let's just let's just embrace failure for a bit, right? So let's say that we know that thing will go up and we will be in trouble. So when we're in trouble, let's try to reduce the amount of damage that you know, that could happen. So, so we'd still like to uh, to let's say retry three times, right? But instead of just randomly retrying three times, let's let's uh, let's let's just form two uh, two fixed sets of three nodes each. So A, B, and C, D, E, and F. And we'll say half the requests will go to A, B, and C, and the other half will go to D, E, and F. Now, if if a uh, if some uh, uh, if some bad request goes into A, B, and C, um, and you, we retry try on all three of them, then we might knock out A, B, and C, but we'll still have D, E, and F up, right? So we'll still have half a request. Um, uh, they should still be okay. Okay. So can we in, can we improve on that? Oh, sorry. Uh, so so uh, so like one one uh, uh, so one property that you know I like to point out here is that overlaps in the sets aren't terrible, right? So in this case, we have five nodes instead of six, um, two sets, A, B, and C, uh, uh, and uh, D, E, and C. Now, if, uh, if some request takes out A, B, and C, um, C from set two is down, but D and E still work, right? So you're still OK. Um, so with those observations, right, OK, so, so the overlaps are not bad. Um, and the more distinct sets we have, uh, the safer we are, right? The smaller the blast radius. So what's the largest number of sets that we could have? That's n choose r. Um, in the case of six nodes, there are 20 sets. So now what we'll do, okay, is we'll we'll create these 20 sets, and for uh, you know, and for each request, we'll map one to uh, we'll we'll map to uh, to to one set here. So let's say our request came, comes in and it maps to this set A E F, right? Uh, and it kills off A E and F. Well, what's nice is is uh, each one of these servers. Um, uh, so for, for each set that contains A, E, or F, there are two other servers. Uh, there are, there's at least one other server that is not E or F that's still in that set. So the entire site is still, is still operational except for that one set. There are 20 of these sets. Um, one is down, so we've, uh, we've failed in 5% of our, you know, our, uh, our, um, uh, you know, our, our, our keys. So that's much better than the entire site going up and down very quickly, right? So let's see how this works. Um, all right, uh, that is this guy. Oh, uh, the actual code for this is very straightforward, right? Power of Python, uh, you can just calculate all, all of the combinations of something. Uh, whoops, and then um, uh, and then you just uh, just mod and uh, you just just do a hash and mod to it. Um, uh, that that works fine for um, for small numbers of of, uh, of R. Um, so six choose three isn't so bad. Even you know even a hundred choose three isn't terrible, right? Um, if you have like very large n's and uh, and, and and R's, then you might want to do something smarter like um, uh, like reservoir slam sampling or something. So, all right. So let's see. So I put in uh, I just put in. I just put in rendezvous hashing. How does it look? I, I'm sorry. I just said rendezvous. I meant shuffle sharding. Uh, so, so how does it look? This is much better, right? Um, there aren't any uh, any huge drops, right? Uh, the site is still operational, and the error rate is much lower than um, you know than with random. Awesome, great. Solved all problems. All right. Um, okay. So what have we done here, right? Um, uh, we made the assumption that R is actually very important. I just argued that R is important. But what if R is not important, right? Like, what if your requests don't spike, or uh, you know, or the number of requests um, doesn't really have anything to do with your errors? Um, then what happens is, you know, let's say that you've got three servers that are on the same uh, same um, uh, power supply or something, right? And they all go down at once. What we've done is we've guaranteed failure, right? We're putting our data. Um, on every single possible three-server combination, so there's a hundred percent chance that we will fail. That's not good. Um, there could be a very high cost of failure here, right? So, so uh, you know, in the case of this service that I created, uh, maybe if uh, if uh, we're not responding to some customers, they start complaining, and then we have to go to Twitter and say, "Oh, there's a problem. You know, we're currently investigating it." Uh, as long as they're going to Twitter, um, it doesn't matter if like a quarter of our customers are failing or half of our customers are failing. That's you know, they're both bad, right? Um, uh, right, so that's that's a load balancing case. Uh, let's think about it in the case of just copies of data, right? Um, right, so right, so you have a database that's replicated. Um, uh, let's say that it's on three different nodes. Those three nodes fail, and you have to go to tape backup. I, does anybody have tape backup? 
I don't know. I think Google has tape backup. <laughs> Uh, so, so right. So you have to go to tape. Um, going to tape is actually very expensive, uh, and it doesn't matter when you go to tape if you pull out one gig or one terabyte. It'll take about the same amount of time. Um, so, um, so you might be willing uh, to trade off um, some amount of damage, right? Like, accept more damage uh, for the for the chance that you won't have to, um, you know, be damaged at all, right? Um, so, um, yeah. So let's uh, let's shift, shift gears just slightly and think about data. Um, so, uh, uh, here are a couple of definitions. So, let's say n is a number of nodes, r is, r, r is a number of copies of data. You know, this is kind of like what we've been, been, you know, been going over already. Uh, there's this new thing here now called scatter width, right? So, scatter width is, um, is uh, the number of different nodes. Uh, so, if one node fails, the number of different nodes that you can draw from to restore that one node, that's scatter width. So, in the case of shuffle sharding, um, we've produced every single possible set, which means that for uh, if if if, uh, if some node has failed, we can draw from all of the other nodes to restore that one node. Right? So that's scatter width. Right? This uh, this is hopefully intuitive. Um, so uh, right, so shuffle sharding is s is equal to n. Uh, s uh, the scatter width is n n minus one. That's all of the other nodes. Um, here, though, you know, we've we've seen that there's a hundred percent chance of of, of of failure if three machines go down, and we lose five percent of our data if so. So let's see what happens if we tweak the scatter width. Okay, scatter width of four. Um, so these are these are six sets that uh, that I've invented that have a scatter width of four. Um, so the idea here is um, uh, uh, you'll take some key and you'll map it to one of these six sets, right? If one node fails, let's say node A fails, well, uh, the stuff that was on node A, um, there are copies of it on there's uh, there's some copies of it on B and C, and then there's some copies of it on E and F as well. Uh, and in this set, it's it's, a, it's the same F and B. So so here we say that there are four servers, B, C, E, and F that A can draw from uh, if if uh, if A goes down. Um, so there are six sets. If one set goes away, um, we lose one sixth of our data, um, and the chance of that happening is is six out of the total number of sets there are. Right, so that's thirty percent. Scatter width of two. So we saw this case earlier. Um, uh, so um, uh, yeah. So in this case, uh, uh, the uh, the chance of failure is much smaller, right? But if something does fail, um, then you know then we've lost half of our data. Um, so notice something in in all of these cases, uh, the expected data loss is the same, it's 5%. It's just the chance of failure changes, and when something fails, the amount of failure changes. So that's neat. Um, so yeah, how important is S? S is very important, right? Um, so, uh, so, so your scatter width, um, that changes uh, your, 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 your P of F. Um, it changes the, uh, the speed that you can, you can restore uh, some node, right? So a low scatter width means a low chance of failure, but a high amount of damage at a slow restore. And a high scatter width means a, a high chance of failure, but a small amount of damage and a fast restore. So it's you know, some, some, some trade-offs here. OK, so I've been going on and on about this, but how do we actually uh, create these sets? So, so this is a, a copy set. Um, so, so the way that copy set works is this. So, so we'll, we'll say, uh, we'll create P random permutations of the nodes. I'll get back to like what, what P actually is, but let's just say that we'll create P of them. Right? Um, we take these permutations and we group them into blocks of our nodes, um, and then we win the end. Um, so, okay, so here's an example. So uh, we have nine nodes. We're making three copies of the data. Um, we're doing a scatter width of four, uh, and P is equal to two. Uh, again, I'll come back to, to how we calculate p. So the first permutation we come up with is, look at that, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. OK, great. So we group those uh, into, into blocks of size 3. So uh, the first set is 1, 2, 3, you know, then, uh, 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 then 4, 5, 6, and then 7, 8, 9. OK, so that's, that's, that's our first p. Our second p is 1, 4, 7, 2, 5, 8, 3, 6, 9. OK, so we group those guys as well. Let's put them together. So in total, we have six sets here. So the algorithm is this. Okay, so we've got some uh, some some uh, some key, and we decide uh, 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 which uh, which node we'd like to be uh, to uh, to serve as a primary for uh, you know for uh, for this key, right? So let's say that is node one. Then the way that we figure out um, where copies of that data should be 
is, a, is just a random picking uh, from the sets that contain node one. So in this case, node one is in two, two sets, one, two, three, and one, four, seven. Right? We get some key. Um, we, uh, we pick, uh, we could do like, you know, like, like a hash of key or could, you know, it could just be random. Um, uh, either one, two, three, or one, four, seven, but not both uh, for the copies of that key. All right, um, so how do we actually pick P? Okay, so, um, so here's the observation. So uh, for us to have uh, a, a perfect set of, 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 uh, of sets, uh, we want at most one overlapping node, right? So for instance, it does us no good to have a set that's one, two, three, and a set that's one, two, four, um, because uh, we'd much rather, uh, you know, we'd much rather uh, not have the two in both of them. Um, so, uh, here, uh, I just happen to pick two, you know, two, two permutations that are, um, are, uh, you know, are, um, uh, you know, have this property. Um, so, right. So let's assume that we've got this property. Okay. So the scatter width, right? The number of of, of nodes uh, that one appears in is uh, is p, right? It's 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 the number of of, uh, of permutations that we picked. I just realized I have part one and part two. Those should say perm one and perm two. Um, and then. Uh, the uh, the scatter width, right, is uh, it, right. So so that's a number of of nodes uh, that you can draw data from for one, right? So the scatter width is p times every other node uh, there could be in those two sets. So in this case, it's uh, it's uh, it's two, you know, which is r minus one. So the scatter width is p times r minus one. You just solve for p. Um, so that's how you get. Uh, so that's how you get p. Um, so, uh, so the algorithm for doing this uh, is just randomly picking these permutations. Um, you have no guarantee that you'll 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 actually hit uh, hit this um, uh, this this first point here. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, that could be a problem. Like, is it actually a problem? So, the people who came up with copy sets uh, ran a simulation, and they found that um, they found that if you randomly pick these these uh, you know these sets. Um, if you have a very large number of n versus uh, your uh, your your s, um, it actually performs pretty close to optimal. Um, actually, calculating uh, the the optimal sets, I think, is an MP hard problem. I wasn't able to find any literature there, but it's kind of cover set ish. So, um, trying to calculate uh, uh, you know the the perfect sets is um, most likely um, most likely wrong. Or hard. Um, so uh, yeah. So what other areas do people use these in? Uh, this this technique was actually uh, first uh, first invented like a hundred years ago for um, uh, for figuring out where to put um, uh, you're like experimenting on a bunch of different types of crops and you want to know like how um, uh, how they respond to different properties of soil, um, but you don't have an infinite amount of soil. So what you do is um, you know you say uh, all right, I'm, I'll, I'll take all these plots of land. So one crop can be uh, can can grow in one plot. So you have all these different plots. Uh, you group them all so that they have s pretty similar characteristics. So uh, all plots in one group, um, uh, they're called blocks, I think. Uh, all crops in one block uh, will have the same sort of moisture in you know in soil or the same you know the same amount of sunlight or something. Um, and then what you're trying to do is plant your crops in the largest number of different blocks as possible, but also cover all crops. So this is kind of like you know you've got um, you'd like to place uh, place your node uh, place you you would like to place your key um, in as many different uh, different uh, uh, um, uh, sets as possible, right? But you also want to cover all of your keys. Right? Uh, software testing you've got um, uh, n uh, possible inputs or properties that you like to test to some system. Um, the combinations of them might create some bugs, so you would like to test uh, all of them, right? So that's two to the n combinations, but running one test might be very expensive. So what you do is you you group smaller um, uh, smaller combinations of tests, and you want to ensure that you run the tests as much as possible to cover all, all of your tests. So in this case, one test run would be uh, one set uh, your you know your tests are the nodes. Okay. Um, so that's all I'm good. Okay. So, what are some uh, some some problems with this? Um, so let's go back to shovel sharding. Um, so at Charpy, we um, we have uh, 
cluster level checks. So we, we check whether or not an entire API is up. Um, shuffle sharding makes that check a little bit uh, problematic, right? Um, because uh, if you put shuffle sharding in, you're ensuring that uh, that API will stay up, right? Um, uh, what you need to do then is look for low amounts of error rates on your APIs, and not you know, and uh, uh, not you know, not if your uh, like if your entire API is up or not. Okay, so that's a problem. Um, uh, so the second problem is uh, to pick the correct key to shuffle on. Um, you need to sort of have knowledge of what could be poisonous, right? If uh, if your poison request um, uh, doesn't have anything to to right, to do with the thing that you're shuffling on, then you're you're uh, you're as good as random. Uh, and, you know, we saw how great random was, right? Um, so uh, you know, and then you also have to to right, uh, to to know like what kinds of failure uh, are you willing to tolerate, right? Do you want to um, totally embrace failure or try to uh, reduce failure, um, right? So there, are, you know, so there's some you know, some things you have to keep in mind there. Um, all right, so. Uh, what what's happened here? Um, basic sharding is easy, right? Um, we saw that uh, that if you if you do it in a basic way, there could be some bad cases of failure, right? Um, all these algorithms that, that I've I've uh, I've shown are pretty easy to uh, to actually code up. Uh, they're really hard to internalize, though. Like I I, I found with the coffee set stuff that I literally um, uh, you know spent months on it and like still. Don't you know? Don't feel like I have a great intuition for what's going on, um, but like maybe that's not a big problem, right? It's like maybe, maybe, um, maybe, ooh, like what you need to do is just just get the technique right once, and then just re just you know, you know just reuse it over and over again, right? So for instance, nobody really writes consistent hashing anymore. Uh, there's one library called libkatama. Everyone just uses that. Um, the memcache uh, library that you're using in your favorite language probably uses libkatama or copies its algorithm. Um, so you don't even have to think about it. Uh, that's nice, I guess. Um, and finally, uh, Murphy. Murphy was an optimist, right? So, so he said, um, well, I don't know if Murphy actually said this. I don't know even know who Murphy is, but right, what 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 can what can go wrong will go wrong. That's an optimistic view. The pessimistic view is what can go right will go wrong, right? Um, what we've done here, though, is we you know we have these 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 techniques to sort of control the wrongness, right? So. We know what will go wrong will go wrong, but hey, you know we can contain uh, just how bad that is, right? And we have knobs for uh, you know trying to figure out uh, how much of that containment we want. So I think that's kind of neat. Um, anyways, uh, so that's all I got. Um, are, are there any questions? No questions at all. Yeah. The one sixty. Yeah. Uh, so I think what it is is. Um, um, uh, right, so this is a V node thing. Um, I think it has to do with the output of of of, of the hash functions. Um, you don't have to like if you uh, if you pull out like small, uh, you, you can run one hash function and then pull out small sm small small parts of it to get all of your V nodes. Um, so I think I think people are trying to do it to like sort of just reduce the amount of work that you have to do up front. Um, you want some large number, and in fact there there there, there are calculations that say oh you know if you want to tolerate um, you know, uh, 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 like this amount of variance or something, right? Then you need uh, something that's a function of of um, of, of n. Um, uh, that function of n uh, tends to produce numbers that, uh, in the real world, are like less than a hundred. So people just say, oh, let's just throw in throw in one sixty, and it's easy. Uh, any other questions? No. All right. Thanks.